to come over here. Does that work? Okay. I'm really pleased uh, to be invited to be part of this gardening series. And um, so I want to thank the Bethel Library and the Bethel Garden Club. Uh, indeed, it was a pleasure uh, to have them ask me what I would like to speak on. I thought of several things, uh, but I decided shade is one of our biggest problems. And um, shade it is one of those things that you always find it evolving. Either you bought a house with a lot of trees around it and had shade, or you bought a new house that was in the middle of a flat field with not even foundation plantings. And eventually you have to add things uh, to make it either less sunny or add some shade so it's cooler or if, as in many houses in Newtown and in Bethel, we've had a lot of storms in the last few years and we've lost a lot of trees. That makes what used to be shady now, if you're lucky, dappled shade, partial shade, or even if you lose a lot of trees, you're back to sun. So I thought tonight I would tell you different ways you can deal with the shade. Um, I have a handout that will have that has a huge list of plants recommended for shade partial shade but i thought rather than bore you with lists and names i'll show you pictures and explain about what i know that different people have done to make the shade just their their very own to make it more fun to see to be to be enjoying it and to changing it when we first moved into our house. It had a traditional front lawn and a side yard. The whole front corner and side was totally covered with pachysandra and the hill down the front had juniper and an entire colony of woodchucks <laughs> living from the front yard all the way through to the backyard. So I waged war on the woodchucks and managed to cut back some, well, we got rid of all the juniper and we put in a few plants and then we, um, I cut back the pachysandra and that was labor intensive and in difficult and I made grass and the grass was wonderful for a few years and then John started noticing it was awfully hard to get the lawnmower around the corner in the intricate ways to this little patch of grass on the front lawn. So thinking that he really needed a little help in the yard, I got rid of all the grass and made it a shade garden. And that's what you were looking at. Oh, there it is. It's back. That's the shade garden uh, that's in the front side of our house. And I really enjoy it because my grandson helped make the walk that we put in right here. And it was just loose, you know, pieces of stone. And <sighs> next to the stone wall, I put in the rhododendrons so that we get some color when they bloom. And you'll notice in the, in the backdrop, way at the top of the screen here, this was a screen we have spent years developing because when I stood on my front doorstep, I could see straight through that passageway to my neighbor's front door. And I just wanted a little more privacy than that. So we have put in green giant arborvitaes and we have some holly and some boxwood. And on the sides, I've used, this is a Lerope that comes up. In fact, it looks pretty good right now. Uh, it does not die down completely in the winter. It's still, this is the variegated Lerope. And in the summer, it's much more white uh, and green. And in 
the backdrop here, this is my favorite shade garden because I have different colors of columbine. Here in the corner, I've got one that's purple. It's so purple that it actually looks black. And then I've got a single yellow one. And then way in the back, that's about back here, if we, it's not on the screen, is my red and white. Um, and they do very well. Columbine actually can do well in the sun and um, it can do partial shade and full shade. So it's one of my favorite things to use. This slide is from my dear friends, Marilyn and Steve Klepfer. Their house was interesting. Whoever built it, they, they built it on halfway up a hill that was totally covered with trees. They had no fr real front yard or backyard. Uh, the whole, what would have been a side yard was really their winding driveway and a garage. And the other side, And oh. hmm. oh, thank you. That fixed it. Yeah, <laughs> but unfortunately, that means that you're no longer. Oh, they can't hear me. Yeah, at home. I can't hear you at home. No. Oh, oh dear. My voice is not that loud. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We should be better. Are back on? Yes. Oh, you are magic. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So um, they actually had one side yard where the kids could play, and they said they were trying to grow grass there for years, but it was not really successful. What they eventually did was where you could see the chairs and this flat, a flat portion in the front. That actually was all originally part of this hillside. They had the dirt removed. They did some of it themselves with wheelbarrows, and I believe they then had a little bit of help to get this dirt removed, and they put it on the front side of their house in amongst the trees. And they built this absolutely magnificent garden that goes all the way up the hill. And what makes the garden so successful, I think, is their use of textured plants. And you can see all the shades of green. Um, there's a saying in Ireland, and I forget the number, um, but Ireland has 40. 40 shades of green. Thank you. And it's true. I've been there and I've seen it. And I think Marilyn's garden comes really close. I think she's got about 38 shades of green all around her yard. And the Besides the slope, what makes it just breathtaking is that no matter what time of year you're in her yard, there's something of interest. So she has all season interest. And that, as you can see on just right here on, in the forefront, is just a small pot with a, I believe that's a begonia in it. And she's got some interesting, all over her yard, she's got beautiful antiques and some interesting things that she features. And you can see the different heights of the plants. The white in the back is really one of the best places to put white flowering bushes because they really show up and white will advance. If you look at two vases on a shelf and one is black and one is white, the white one will kind of stand out more and be coming toward you. So if you put a deep red bush up at the top of her slope, it would not show up as much. The blossoms wouldn't show as much as the white does. And as I, could, as I said, you can see many, many different textures. There's fine needles, there's round shapes, and um, it's beautiful. On the side of her house, where I told you they had been struggling for the longest time with grass, they, they felt that their grandkids should be able to play some sort of sports on the side yard. But eventually, they did get grass and moss to grow. But 
they took the whole rest of that side and made walkways and put up a gate and made a beautiful shade garden. It's a very restful place. And it used a lot of the land by putting in the hardscape of stone. And it, it's really lovely and all year long. This is my backyard, what it looks like as you can see, early spring. And uh, we've got the, the traditional big grass backyard. That's where the only sun seems to be. You know, the sun shines on the soccer goal and it shines on the lacrosse rebounding net that we seem to have for the grandkids, but not so much on my flowers or vegetables. <laughs> and But it's more fun to watch the kids play. But in the back, we do have gardens, and I will show you that there's different plants that you can use in many places. So early spring, I enjoy the daffodils because the deer don't eat them. I don't usually bother with tulips ever because they don't last as long as daffodils and the deer really like them. We have way back so it's at the top of your screen. This is our deep woods back in here. When we moved in, there was nothing green in there. It was just all trees. And now you can see I've put some of my bulbs. We have a fence that has been added by our neighbors in two parts. So you can see the different coloring. And that is the deep shade. All of this will have some perennials coming up later they, they'll come in after the um, daffodils. Uh, I add interest by using these lovely birds and a statue and um, whatever I can. This is actually part of our deer fence and the deer fencing is very thin. If you looked at it you'd think you, you could actually push it over but it keeps the deer out. They don't mind at all. They, they, they walk their path now used to be through our yard and down the side of our house. The deer now walk all back here and go down the side of my neighbor's house. <laughs> <laughs> That's just fine with us. We have an agreement. I, we tell them they are welcome to, you know, shoot them and, and share the venison anytime they want, but they are not gardeners. They have a beautiful garden near their terrace and the rest of the yard. It's, it's okay if the deer walk through. So we have a very great arrangement there in the neighborhood. Uh, let's see. This is the continuation of the side. And what we've done is we've added peonies that everybody, of course, will say that definitely has to have sun. Peonies love sun. But you'll notice they're only on the front edge of the garden because they get the most sun. The sun comes up over the front of our house, across and down behind the my deep woods and so the peonies work very well in the front and behind them we have some irises and then for privacy it's a thinner privacy hedge right here i'm still working on it uh, this is an early picture of the yard um, what we now have planted back here are some rhododendrons some andromeda. We have three holly bushes, uh, the Blue Prince holly, because they're um, slightly smaller and you have to have a male and a female. So we have a two princess and one prince and they're all back in here. We leave a gate opening here so we can get into the side yard and up the hill easily. This is uh, again later in the year and you'll see what I've added is we have an iris in the front. I've added some height because your garden always needs to have different levels of interest. So what I have here is <laughs> trellises. Uh, there are three of them and they will have climbing vines on them. I've used morning glories. Uh, I've used um, scarlet runner peas 
they look they have beautiful flowers and, and they they have the pea pods that are this big you know four inches five inches long bright red they do very well on it and there's some climbing nasturtium or climbing thimonia that um, work very well uh, scattered throughout we use a kind of a gumdrop approach rather than straight rows and lines with our plants and back in here you can see there's a there were a few blueberry bushes and um these are boxwoods and azaleas and andromedas alternating this is just directly opposite what you're looking at I like to have fun. If you walk in the garden, you know, if I could find something that makes you laugh, I, I smile, I, I feel like I've been successful. I like to walk in my garden and see my old friends. And this is my frog trio. They play for me all the time. And they're sitting in an antique iron kettle. And every year I kind of have a different theme, different plants that I'm going to put in that kettle. And it's kind of fun. It, it's not hard to design and it just takes a few flowers, but I usually put annuals in it, something tall in the middle. And um, back here, you can see there's some blue salvia. And then right there. And then going back, where again, you're going into the deeper shade. So behind the salvia, we have uh, some rhododendrons, PJM. Uh, azaleas, and then the back row behind it is green giant arborvitae. John loves his roses, and they kind of get scattered on the front edge and around the middle and down the side. And he's very, I, I don't do roses, he's very successful with them because he's very diligent about doing all the things that roses seem to require. So we have both the, the mixed, and, and I've been known to throw a few of my vegetable plants. If he loses a rose bush, then I usually quickly replace it with a cucumber or <laughs> green pepper, something useful. Um, and again, oh, the, you can see there's my frog trio lounging and one of my famous tomato cages. And I put them, as you see, in between the flowers, whatever, if there's an open spot, I'll put something there. And one year I had leftover cucumbers. So I planted those all around this tomato cage only to discover that the cucumbers were thriving. They had so many cucumbers, we practically had to get a wheelbarrow to take them out of the yard. And I had the latest tomatoes that year ever. And they didn't get any tomatoes till about September. So I don't recommend that, but it, it does, it makes it interesting with the challenges. This is an example of compromise. I want my neighbors to be friendly, but not to be seeing me when I'm out gardening. And when I'm in my yard, I don't want to see my neighbors or anybody else, because I usually I'm not dressed for anybody to see me. I'm wearing my gardening clothes. And so after I put in about 20 of these green giant arborvitaes, John said, enough. He did not want any more. And he loves forsythia. So the front half where it's important because of the neighbors, we have the green giant arborvitae making a very thick and, and dense hedge and, and screen. This is the back half of the garden of the yard. And the forsythia blooms, as you can see, this is early spring, probably before Easter or just at Easter time. And we do get blooms, we get leaves. It's not as dense as th this, but it works. And we can see, we can look down on two houses and see somebody else and, th and their kids having fun in the yard. This is my example of how to get special interest in your garden you know it, it doesn't take much you can have one specimen tree we have a lot of trees all surrounding us in the woods and they're big oaks and we have a gorgeous kusa dogwood on the front lawn but this is a golden chain tree and it was my father's favorite tree and it's 
we always had one at our house. And if this tree is a specimen, it, as you see on the right, that is what each chain looks like. This is three years old that I've had it now. The first year we had one chain, and then the second year we had a few more, and third year it was filled with the chains. And um, they can grow 20 feet tall, and they can take either sun, partial shade, or even full shade. As you go into the darkness, there'll be fewer blooms, but if it's your passion, why not have it? Oh, that, wow. that is our front stairs. <laughs> and I can't tell you really how amazing that was. This year we had a red and a green coleus on the right. The, the year before we had an absolutely screaming red coleus. Every year, John finds something different and he says, that's what I want to put out front. And, and this is his thing. Last year, that coleus was 46 inches tall. Wow. I measured it for the garden club. I put, I had to use two yardsticks. I measured it and, and I had a picture of him standing there too. And it is truly 46 inches tall. How it got, it, part of it was the variety and the other, that gets morning sun. No afternoon, so it doesn't get too hot and baked out, but it survives very happily there. And How many plants are there? Uh, two flowers. 18 from top to bottom. Okay, 18 from top to bottom. Okay. We got them at, um, what is the name of the place where we go? Uh, no, no, it's down by the um, bridge going near Sikorsky's. Mm -hmm. oh, I'll think about later. I'm sorry. Uh, let me move on. But um, they have wonderful hanging Mother Day for Mother's Day. They Philanowski's. 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 And and they they have about 20 greenhouses i mean it, it's like you need to put on your hiking boots or get you know rent a scooter because you could not go through all of their uh, greenhouses and mother's day you have to park at least a, a, a mile away from their establishment and they take cash only like boy <laughs> or checks they will but no credit cards and their plants are amazing it's Philanowski's and it's in it, no, it, uh, you go over the, the Sikorsky Bridge and take Daniel's farm. If John, could you look it up on your cell phone? Okay. And it's um, it's there. People told me about it for years and it took me three years to find it because nobody else ever remembered what town it was in or how you got there. So we'll look it up for you and tell you at the end. Um, but anyway, it, it, part of it was the variety and the, and the other thing is its location. That is getting some in the morning, but it's not baking out. And it, um, this is one of my favorite plants. We discovered this about three years ago. It's called black pearl and it's an ornamental pepper plant. The, it's hard to see with, you know, taking pictures of shaded things. Right here, you can see a red berry. This one's all, almost red. And back in here, you can see all the black berries. This has black leaves and dainty little purple flowers. The purple flowers turn into the black berries. The black berries, as they mature, become red. So the bush, by the end of the summer, this plant has red and black berries on it with the black leaves. It's really striking and it can grow to two feet tall if it's in a really sunny spot. Partial shade or in a pot, it won't be quite as tall. It'll be a little bit thinner but still worth planting. The amazing thing about it is they're hot peppers. They're about the size of the largest blueberry and they're round. 
They are not pepper shaped, they're round. And they are so much fun because you can eat them. Uh, I don't recommend it because I don't like hot food. <laughs> but what I've learned to do, the first plants we bought were up in Rhode Island. Yes, we we're in Rhode Island. And they were quite expensive. And so I saved a couple of branches at the end of the season, dried them out. And the next year, I opened one and they, they shrivel up. They, they're red, they're hard and shriveled. I opened them up and took out the seeds and I planted them. And mine, they all germinated. Oh, and when I got upstairs, I touched my face. Oh, oh, oh big <laughs> mistake. I washed my hands and it took two days to get that hot pepper off my hands. So I caution you, uh, a friend of mine used one berry in her stew of, I think she was making chili and her son actually ate one for about 10 oh seconds. And he said it was the hottest hot pepper he had ever had. <laughs> so I don't recommend eating them, but they certainly are a showstopper. These can be in containers, border plants, I, I use them both in, in my containers and in the front of my flower garden. Going up the stairs to my upper patio, I have a series of the very heavy, beautiful blue pots. A friend was moving and she started us by giving us four or five of these very big pots. And of course I added to the collection not realizing that every fall we have to drag them in, empty them, but they're worth it because they're absolutely beautiful. I used to invite my, my three nephews to come to the house at Easter time during that vacation and say, we're gonna have a pot party. And <laughs> they, they, they were disappointed when they learned Aunt Peggy meant you were gonna take the pots from the shed and bring them out and distribute them any way you wanted. They, they were free to put them wherever they wanted around. Uh, so we still do that. And um, I try to make the pots a little bit different each year. Going up the stairs because it's closest to the barbecue grill, I combine herbs with flowers and uh, you can see that just about anything we like can go, grows very well from scallions to thyme, sage, parsley, uh, and um, basil is my favorite. And yes, basil is my favorite and I have, usually I grow a very small uh, basil that's called um, boxwood basil. It's very intense and, and if you really baby it, bring it in the house at the end of the summer, it will grow into a big round ball, almost like a boxwood tree, and it has covered with white flowers and it is the most pungent of all basils. And so that's my favorite one. And as you see in this pot, I've got some dahlias and the flowers, some alyssum growing on the side. And then all around on the far edge of the patio, I have different containers going all lining the whole top patio. And you gotta have fun. So this is my crazy pots. Um, I, I have, I generally place this in the, in a very dark shady corner uh, between our porch and, and the side of the house. And I have been known to move it around and put it in the gardens. This is held together by a structure I bought at the Hartford Flower Show a number of years ago. It's got, I put heavy rocks in the bottom one, the bottom pot, because it can tip over with all this weight. Oops, tease you with what you're going to see in a minute. Um, it, that's a lot of weight. Most people use graduated pots, but they're too small for me. I, I do things in a big way. So, so I like all the same size pots. Um, those I found uh, at, how was it, um, at the Big Lots. And I they already had holes drilled in the bottom. So what you need is your pot with a hole in the bottom and you need a sturdy rod, like the, the um, 
at the Agway or any of the places you can buy gardening, you know, for your garden, the poles, like four foot, five foot poles, and they're metal with a plastic casing over them. Those work very well. Uh, this pot has a cross piece inside the pot that keeps the rod straight right there. You can't see it. The rod just goes up through each one. It's like right there and it's right there. It goes through each pot. When you put it in the ground, you have to make sure you get the rod deep enough into the ground so that even when it rains, it's not going to shift and move. But that's kind of for interest and fun. And pots really can add a lot to your yard. My friend, Lisa Shirk, has the most whimsical gardens I have ever seen. She has no lawn. There, there's no grass. They don't own a lawnmower. They don't even have a goat. <laughs> they, they don't need that because they have their house was built in amongst all the trees. It's not mine. <laughs> so this I call her traveling pants. This is on the side of her house or in the back corner. It actually is not like the jeans. I don't know if you ever saw on Facebook a while ago, they were showing ways that in the winter time you could, you could actually freeze dungarees and make them stand. <laughs> uh, but this is not that. This was two tree trunks growing and it was up to one tree. And then in the storm, the tree got damaged and they had to cut it. And when they cut it down, she stepped back and she said, my gosh, it, it looks like a pair of jeans. So, I mean, but I've seen it. It is actually two tree trunks uh, that grew into one tree. Uh, this is also, Lisa's very talented. And she says that she likes to make, oh, sorry, I have bad fingers apparently. Uh, she likes to make people smile in her yard. This is what she calls her tea time sculpture. And um, it is made from a tower, a flower pot, a, no, a teapot, teacups, a vase, and another vase at the top. And it's, again, she uses glue and rods to put up the middle so they stay stationary. And she can put bird feed in the top one, and she has that for, you know, a bird feeder. I mean, this, she said she went to the dump one day and there was a lonely, sad bowling ball just <laughs> sitting there. So she had to take it home. And she was, I believe, at the beach uh, later that summer with her grandkids. And they all spent about two or th two weeks at the beach at night gluing pennies to the bowling ball and again she uses that glue that is i can never remember the name of it because e600 you get it and that's what people generally use for the kind of glue for outdoor glass things right that works and this one is the same thing i believe uh, my other friend i don't know where lisa got this bowling ball but my other friend told me marilyn whose garden we saw at the beginning she went bowling with her grandchild and said, well, I'm here, I'll ask. So she asked if they had any bowling balls they were going to throw out. They said, oh yes, take your pick. So she went home with one and uh, I'm not sure whether she's going to, I think she's going to do it with the pennies. But Marilyn, uh, the second one that Lisa did is uh, embellished with marbles and pieces of glass. And it's quite lovely. And then again, you see that's a repurposed um, bottom pedestal from a birdbath, I believe. She also does stones. <laughs> she has a great sense of humor. I love her ladybug crossing in a very dark, you know, as you can see, foundation planting corner. And my favorite is the rock concert. <laughs> it is just so cute. And I, I have my 
six-year-old and four-year-old grandsons painting rocks at the moment, hoping that someday I can make a rock concert <laughs> myself. <laughs> so, um, my favorite shade flower is, of course, the columbine, and it comes in, in so many colors, and it will reseed itself if you just leave it. It's often, it's most often thought of as a biannual. It takes two years for them, uh, but if you buy one that's from uh, the nursery or, or Hollandia, wherever you go, if you buy a columbine in a pot, it's usually blooming. And from that one, if you have it in a nice setting, partial shade, shade, or even a little bit of sun, it will have, um, it'll reseed itself and you'll have many more in a year or two. So. There are many good books on shade and um, I brought three of them. I've listed them here um, and I find they're expensive and but they are wonderful. My favorite has a shade garden where they talk about the texture and the height. And really that's what you need is texture to make it um, interesting all year round. And um, the other thing I do is I use my cell phone. If any one of um, the, if any one of the plants you're curious about, if you look them up on your cell phone, you can find exactly what the scientific name is, and you can usually find it to buy as a plant or as seeds, whatever you want. So, do you have any questions? That ends my slide presentation. Okay. Thank you for your technical help. Um, I'm going to make a presentation. This is a lovely bowl that was handmade and was given to me. And this is going to be part of, this is your raffle item. And I'm going to make a, what I call a container garden. And when you use something like this, cause this would be used in the house or on your porch, and eventually you could make these this kind of a garden if it had a hole in the bottom and put it outside any one of these dish gardens would look beautiful on your stones on your tree trunks that are cut not quite low enough or indeed um raised up on a brick or two above your pack of sand <laughs> so, whatever you have in a shade garden, I like to put some gravel. I should have shown you. This is just white gravel, the stones on the bottom because you're always over water and it is definitely going to need some good drainage. Um, these are all too. Oh, I like to work in layers. So the first layer is the coarsest gravel. This is a finer gravel. Actually, it's quite attractive. Sometimes I use this on the top of a pot. Um, it also is what they consider bonsai mix. So this layer is good for filtering. So I have two layers now, one of gravel, one bonsai, and the dirt. This is regular potting mix. I like pro mix to start my plants. I use pro mix for just about my, my pots, whatever I need. And now I showed you pictures and pictures of what have, do I want you to remember? Variety of texture. <coughs> Notice this plant is thin and it's kind of spiky. It's got lots of cut leaves. So that is going to go in. What is it? It is a fern. I don't know all the na names of ferns because there's so many different ones, but I know if you, they're beautiful and they come in all sizes. These are house plants. Eventually, because it's the March this yeah. time of year, you can't get anything else. Right. I had to really wrap my brain. Okay, what am I going to do today? I didn't want to just make a floral arrangement. 
So this, I'm spreading apart the bottom uh, of the roots so that it will grow well. And this can, needs to stay in the house right now. You can put it outside when the weather gets warm in a shady spot and it should do well. This is, I have three kinds of ivy because that's what's around right now. And again, they're all slightly different shape and a slightly different color. What is the third color? Yeah, that's a mystery. I haven't a, a clue. And I'm sorry. I bought that at it's a purple get me campanula. So um, I think eventually that if it survives, that could go outside, but I'm not sure it will survive. Yeah. They're a little bit tender, so I wouldn't put it in um, some place that is windy or super wet. They don't like to have super wet. Okay. This one feels like it's been leaned into it. <laughs> and I'm getting my hands on there. I got it. Oh, it was there. So this one. You know, I thought of a lot of things for tonight, but I, I didn't think of paper towels or something to clean my hands <laughs> when I'm done. And they have a bathroom. They, okay, that's good. That's good. Thank you. Oh, you're very kind. And this, of course, you have to have something variegated. I mean, really, you got to bring out the white, the light. And if you're doing a container, normally we say, Thriller, spiller, and filler. filler. So it's thriller, filler, spiller. And this is your spiller. I'm going to spill over the edge, or in this case for tonight, I'm going to wind it so we get more of the color variation. And when I do a, a dish garden, I always put something under it because I, I, you don't know, no matter what the container is, there's some wicking or when you water it, you're going to get it, get water on your favorite table. So this can go, it's got felt feet, this can go under it. And there you have it. Oh, very nice. Your, and usually I put, I'll make a dish garden sometimes like a seam, not, not so filled. And I'll have one tall thing like that looks like a miniature tree. And I'll add stones and make a walkway. And oh, you can have fun with a little fairy garden or something. But for this one, I thought I'd just give you plants that remind you when you're working at your shade garden, you want to have as many colors and textures as you can add. And quite often it's just, I mean, if you've got a whole space with Pachysandra being the, overtaking the world, put a couple of cinder blocks down and put a colorful pot on top and you'd be surprised what that can do for your yard. So, yeah. And I, I actually went out and dug up some moss to put on here, but I tried to um, get it to warm up and so that it would, wouldn't look quite so frozen and dead. And then it's, I didn't like the way it, it, it works. <laughs> it seemed to smell rather differently. <laughs> so I thought best to leave that at home in the garage. So, all right, let me just finish filling this in. I'm gonna ask you, you're gonna fill it in? I'm gonna, yes, I'm gonna <laughs> fill it in with dirt and then you can take it home, well, whoever gets it. And I'll even add water, a little bit. You'll have to water it a little bit. Now, Peggy, while you're doing that, we've got a question from Zoom. Sure. Do you plant new bulbs every fall? We have much shade and only get one bloom per bulb. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I add more. I, I've done it over a course of three years. And I usually put in at least 100 bulbs every year. So, um, it's unusual that they're getting only one one bloom. Are they doing daffodils? Or are uh, they, they don't say they just don't say. yeah. But I get more than one bloom. <laughs> Oftentimes I'll get only one bloom if it's reseeded itself and the wind has carried it mm. from 
where they were originally planted. I, I definitely get more. Any other questions? Yes, a uh, comment in the beginning you showed the, I don't know, I call it the variety. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, yes, yeah. I, I say the rope. Yeah. What, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Either way. Either way. Um, it also in the fall has a, a nice little spiky purple oh, yeah. um, flower. So it, it um, you know, it has that nice sort of texture, breezy look in the, in the season. And then toward the end, when a lot of other things are dying back, it comes up with these nice little purple spiky flowers. Right. It, uh, the, the, again, sorry, I call it the rupee, but and I've heard most, many people say it, sure. it, it, doesn't um, <laughs> it also has white. Now, yeah. I have some that's not variegated in another location and it has white roots. So it, it's, it's one of my favorite things. And a lot of landscapers recommend using that on a hillside. I wanted it just on my walk on yes. both sides. And actually tell you the truth, I bought the mail order, which I don't do for many things, yeah. but I knew I needed a lot of them. So I bought, what is it? Four, three or four of their offerings. So that probably was like 12, 12 plants or eight, 18 plants. The first year did the right side of the walk. And by the second spring, they all had babies and I put them on the left side. <laughs> and that walkway is what, three, this will be the fourth year. And it's wow. totally covered all the way down. Well, that's yes. that you've got. Yeah. It it is. Um, it, it's not. It's not technically. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it looks like. Grass. It looks like grass, <laughs> and it, it it works beautifully in flower arrangements. I use it really yes. a lot in my flower arrangements, and then I just like the way it looks even in the fall. Um, and it's tough. It's, it's like I don't. Yeah. I use it a lot in um, like between sidewalks and roads. Peggy, we've got another question. How do crocuses propagate? Carefully at night. <laughs> <laughs> How do they just grow I've, extra little bulbs that you pull them out? Little bulbs with the daffodils too. Daffodils grow like when you have them in a drawer. Like you buy them at the dollar store, mm -hmm. little daffodils. Those are baby daffodils. And if you wait a few more years, they get bigger and then they have baby daffodils around. Okay. And that's how it comes. So to like garlic? Like garlic. Okay. Yeah. So they're just more bulbs underground. You have to dig them up and split them. If you want to, you just leave them. Just let them go. They'll, okay. have to long. they'll just go. Yeah. A lot of times, too, the squirrels. Are, yeah, they'll help. Right. <laughs> and, and the wind. I, I don't know if, if, you know, they have flowers, so they do self pollinate. So some seeds get around. But and because they seem to, you know, in my yard, in my woods, they seem to pop up wherever. So I don't know quite how they got there. Yeah, nothing but the finest water <laughs> for your plants. I hope you enjoy this and it should do very well. If you want in the spring, after you, you if you bring it outside, make sure you give it, 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 introduce it, we call it hardening, harden it off, introduce it to the hot sun or the cold wind, whatever's outside by putting it in shade for about a week. And, and then gradually it can be moved and left, bring it in at night if it's early and, and the night's getting really cold. But these should all survive. You could actually plant them in your garden if you wish. Okay. And thank you very oh, much for inviting me and coming. I'm sorry, I can hear you. An odd number between one and twenty-five. 
Okay, that would be, let's see, what is the oddest number of all? <laughs> Although I think that would be nice, I already said 13. 13, that's an odd number. Yeah. Elizabeth. Really? All right. All right. <laughs> Well, that's a souvenir on the floor. Don't even think about it. I know a Oh, should take care of it. Well, I recommend putting this if you have a porch. What one of my favorite things that I learned to make was up in Rhode Island. Um at one of their garden centers. They happened to be having a moss workshop the day we were shopping. And that lady took a pieces of barn wood. It was just kind of a little bit warped, so it came up. And on the barn wood, she put down the rocks like I did. She put a couple of plants and she added the really well draining soil. So you want to use something that you know is pretty porous. And then she covered it with moss. Uh, it was moss garden. Wow, it was amazing. So, thank you. Thank <laughs> 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 Sometimes, but that's in the world. I'm going to sneak over there. Yeah. Right.